He is summoned as a slave but ends up loving his new life. Kinji is an ugly disgusting nerd who became rich because of crypto. And just like your typical average loser, he spent everything to buy a house in another country. In short, he became your typical rich guy who laughs at all the plebs like us who must get up early and work. But suddenly, a portal appeared under him and took him to a new world called Amuria. There, he found out that there were creatures called semi-demons looking at him as if he were a weirdo. Days later, we find out that Kinyu became a miner for a company named Reizaha. Not because he decided to live a humble life, but because he took a gold loan and couldn't pay for it. He sees Belza, the director of the company, giving a speech to all the workers. She motivates everyone, mentioning that taking big risks will give them great rewards. However, Kinji knows this means one thing, to be explored by your boss. A long time ago, these mines were dungeons filled with monsters and valuable things. The strongest humans used to explore them to become famous and get glory. But as time went on, people found a special rock called Demonite which could be used as a source of energy. Belza told the workers they had to take big risks to get good results. Kinji realized that the Reizaha company was taking advantage of its workers. A month later, Kinji is working when his chief comes to talk about the last month's results. He started blaming Kinji for failing to meet his quota, which ruined their team's overall performance. Kinji explains he was sick last month, but his chief starts telling the same old story. Back in his day, he used to work 40 hours a day for 10 days a week. This made Kinji frustrated. He's been working for 16 hours a day, the living conditions are worse than a refugee, and he can only take a shower once a month. Suddenly, he overheard his co-worker Wanai being blamed for also failing to perform well. Instead of just watching, Kinji started to worry about his situation. He did some math and realized that after paying off his loan, he didn't have much money left. While thinking about this, he dropped a gold coin. He follows it like a maniac, just like any broke dude would do, and ends up finding a secret entrance. Later on, Kinji meets Wanaib and invites him to a fancy bar. Wanaib explains how their chief went bad for him going missing, but Kinji tells him to ignore it. Wanaib then asks how Kinji can afford to get a drink in this place because their wage is the same. Kinji replies he's broke as hell and explains he borrowed some gold. Wanaib then mentions the rumors about Kinji owning 10 million, but Kinji says it's a lie. It's not 10, he owes 20 million. Wanaib realizes he's talking to a crazy guy and decides to leave. But Kinji stops him, mentioning that he found a way to make crazy amounts of money. Just like you, Wanaib wants to stop being broke and accepts the deal. However, he didn't expect that it would involve a company prospecting tour, which is a friendly way to say they will be exploring the mines and possibly find monsters. Even though the company doesn't have work insurance, the leader permits them. While preparing, Wanaib explains that it's dangerous to go deeper into the mine, but Kinji doesn't care about it because the lower floors have way more demonite, and they will also get a bonus if they find other types of ore. Wanaib replies that everyone who goes on a prospecting tour ends up dead, but Kinji explains that he found a secret entrance to the third floor when his coin went through a wall, and he spent the whole afternoon exploring to make sure it was safe. The two go into the dungeon and start collecting as much demonite as they can. While they work, Wanaib thanks Kinji for thinking of him. But Kinji makes it clear that Wanaib is a typical lone loser. But a lone loser is still better than losers who group up with other losers. They gather a lot of ore and are happy, thinking about the money they'll make. As they try to go back to the surface, a big dragon ambushes them and tries to eat them. The boys hide, and Kinji gets upset this is all going to end. Suddenly, he turns to Wanaib, smiling like a freak and asks him to act as bait. Kinji then kicks him against the dragon and runs away. The dragon thanks for the meal, while Wanaib starts apologizing to his parents. Suddenly, Kinji appears on top of a rock and starts talking nonsense. The dragon introduces himself as Rim and Kinji decides to make a deal. If Rim works for him and helps him get demonites, in return, Kinji will give him all the tasty food he wants. Rim agrees to the deal and transforms into a smaller form. Turns out, Rim is a girl. Kinji feels proud of himself, thinking he's on the path to becoming rich again. A month later, their profits go way up, but there's a problem. Kinji made no profit because he spent all his money on food for Rim. He and Wanaib decide to work harder to make more money. While doing this, they find a space filled with magical weapons. Kinji tries to analyze if its condition is good enough to be sold, until Rim reveals that's her toilet area. The two guys get shocked and Kinji throws the staff against Wanaib's face. He's confused because the weapons still look quite clean. Rim explains that's because everything she digests becomes magic power. 
Rim starts complaining that she's hungry, and Kinji panics because he has nothing to offer. Suddenly, Wanibe gets up and offers his tail for Rim to eat. Kinji is confused, but Wanibe claims it will grow back over time. Strangely, Wanibe asks for his next command. Kinji tries to shake him off, thinking he lost his mind. But Rim explains that Wanibe was probably hypnotized when he was hit by the staff. Kinji decides to check it and finds out this staff can brainwash and hypnotize people. Realizing this, Kinji decides to hypnotize all his co-workers, including his chief, to make them work for him non-stop. This boosts their next month's profits making Kinji happy about it. Wanai realizes Kinji is exploiting everyone just like their company does. He tries to tell him this is wrong and a crime to take advantage of their co-workers. But Kinji ignores him, mentioning this has increased their work efficiency. However, this so-called efficiency starts to decrease with time. Rim is the one using the staff, while Kinji tries to make a plan to keep it up. He ordered Wanaib to buy some potions to increase everyone's workload. But Wanaib claimed everyone was already at their limit. Kinji explains everyone should be happy to be his slave, but in that moment, the staff breaks. He continues explaining his whole plan to continue using them and doesn't notice that everyone is back to their normal selves. Suddenly, he notices everyone looking at him while he laughs like a maniac and gets a massive beating. If it wasn't enough, Rim also complains that she's hungry. He tells her to understand his current situation, but her face turns evil as she mentions his promise that she could eat him if she wasn't satisfied. The next day, Kinji goes back to work and finds out that the higher-ups are interested in him and Wanai because they made a lot more money with the valuable demonites. They both get a letter saying they're going to be moved to the exploration division. This group has different sections, like Group 3, which deals with hunting big monsters. They're considered elite and are in charge of making the mining area bigger. After that, we see Kinji and Wanai working in Group 8, which helps the hunters in fighting the monsters. They start by cleaning dungeons and doing small jobs. While working, Wanai opens a dungeon chest out of curiosity, and a tentacled monster comes out and grabs him. In response, Kinji decides to give up some of the things they collected to save Wanai. Later, Kinji gets called by a higher-up who says he has to take over Wanibe's shift because Wanibe is on leave. They also say they're cutting Kinji's pay for getting rid of company stuff to save Wanibe. At home, because he doesn't have much money, Kinji gives Rim some scraps to eat, even though she's not happy about it. Suddenly, she smells something good on Kinji and finds out he's hiding a rare piece of meat. Kinji, who got it for a good price, isn't so lucky because Rim eats it all. This makes Kinji really mad. Furious and with no other choice, Kinji is given an important box of potions to carry and goes back to the dungeon to work. He knows it's not what he's supposed to do with his life, but he doesn't have a choice. While working, he meets a Reza a hunter running from a group of giant ants. The hunter asks Kinji to sacrifice himself for him, but Kinji doesn't listen. Instead, he joins the hunter and jumps into a lake to escape the ants. After a bit, they get to a Reza a warehouse run by an old man. Kinji tries to contact a higher-up for help, but the higher-up doesn't believe him. Monsters were supposed to stay in their territories and not just show up on the upper levels. A bunch of ants attack the warehouse, and Kinji looks for something that could help them get away. He finds a potion that lets them turn into ants. Inside the dungeon, Kinji figures out he can talk to the ants and decides to speak with one named Ante. He convinces it to rebel against its queen, who was treating them badly. Kinji tells the ant that he's an advisor and supporter of ants. He noticed the ant was tired, so he wanted to help. After a few minutes, Kinji talks to most of the ants and leads them to confront the queen, with help from the hunter and the old man. Kinji, now in his human form, faces the queen and convinces her to give the worker ants their rights. He tells her she's not fit to be the queen, and this makes her transform into a giant creature, scaring everyone. Rim shows up in the dungeon, hungry, and tries to eat the ants. Kinji gives her a piece of meat he has, calming her down. The queen ant thanks Kinji for saving them and agrees to work for him. After this, Wanibe comes back to work. Kinji tells him that he started a new company called the Black Company, and he wants Wanibe to join him. Kinji plans to take over Reza a mining company through his new company. After this, Kinji and Wanibe got sent to an island called Chiquero. They had to do corporate training with an instructor named Pig. Pig made them fight dangerous monsters as part of the training. They learned to charge at the monsters. Kinji had a plan, but it didn't work, and he got frustrated. The monster was about to attack Wanai, but since he couldn't move, Pig set off a bomb under the monster and killed it. Pig warned them that next time, it would be under their feet if they didn't handle it right. Later, Pig told them the next test was to reach the top of a mountain, surprising everyone because they hadn't eaten all day. 
pig said they had to show results to eat, so they had to climb the mountain even though they were really tired. During the journey, a tired Kinji sees some plants and, feeling hungry, tries to eat them. But Wanibe stops him, saying those plants can mess with their minds. Kinji is surprised Wanibe knows this, and Wanibe says he grew up in the countryside. They keep going up the mountain. At the top, Pig starts teaching them meditation. When he sees some of them not doing it right, he threatens them with a weapon. While the group rests, Kinji notices Wanibe acting weird, being really happy about all the work. Kinji also sees that Elfman, some creatures with them, aren't happy with the work, but other creatures are. This worries Kinji because he's starting to think like Wanibe, and it doesn't feel right. It turns out Pig has been using different methods to hypnotize the workers, making them work without complaining. For the next few days, all the employees started working happily, becoming total corporate slaves. The Black Mage Division was using a powerful brainwashing spell for hypnosis. Kinji also became a slave and followed the orders. Then, Lady Belza came to visit and praised them for having pure minds, saying they could work forever. They all cheered for her and cried happy tears. Pig announced they finished training, and they were sent back to the company on a boat. Before leaving, they were told to buy expensive figurines to prove their loyalty, and everyone did. But as Kinji was admiring his, someone bumped into him and broke it. That's when Kinji woke up from the hypnosis. During the journey, he made sure Wanai woke up by giving him a punch. They both realized they were being hypnotized, so they ate the plants they found on the mountain, making Pig's hypnosis stop. It was a risk for Kinji, but it worked. It turns out Kinji had left some of these plants and the mage's food on the island, making them rebel and take revenge. They blew up the whole island. After a while, Kinji and Wanai reached the office of the exploration group, where the elite group 3 works. They meet Shia, the heroine, who says she'll be their supervisor from now on. Wanai admires her a lot, surprising Shia. In response, she blushes and accidentally hits Wanai, making him fall unconscious due to her strong punch. Wanai is sent to the hospital again. Shia gives Kinji info about different groups and their work schedules. The mining groups get a base salary, while Group 3 has flexible hours and 100% results-based pay. She also shows him the mart where rare weapons are stored. But Kinji disagrees, saying the company isn't great because they make workers buy their own items if they don't meet the standards. Shia punches him and says he should be happy to work for such an incredible company. Kinji feels uneasy. Shia then decides to explore the third level of a dungeon with Kinji. She asks Kinji to defeat the monster that shows up, but the monster goes straight for her. Shia demonstrates her strength by effortlessly stopping a giant monster and defeating it with her sword in seconds. When Kinji comes across Ante, Shia questions why he hasn't killed it, as monsters in dungeons are supposed to be eliminated. Seeing Kinji's hesitation, she realizes he's against Reizaha's principles and tries to take him down. Kinji calls Rim, who appears and takes Shia's attack on the head. This angers Rim, who then transforms into an adult woman and defeats Shia with one blow. After a few hours, Shia is found bound, leaving her angry and helpless. Sitting with the Ant Queen and Rim, she threatens to tell the company about Kinji's involvement with the monsters. Wanibe arrives on the Ant and is shocked and scared by her threats. But Kinji decides to blackmail her by taking a photo with her and the members of the Black Company, showing she's part of their group. He turns the tables and tells her she'll now work for the Dungeon Black Company. Next, we see Kinji walking through the city after buying food for Rim when he gets stopped by several individuals who take him to a dead-end alley. There, a lone shark from Reizaha appears and reminds Kinji that he still owes them 5 million. If he can't pay within a month, they'll kill him. Following this, we see Kinji heading to a dungeon with Wanaib and Shia because he needs to find a way to earn more money. Kinji is really sad because the debt is too much for him. Along the way, Shia takes the chance to teach them how to fight various monsters, leaving Kinji and Wanaib exhausted. She explains that different parts of the monsters contain mana and could be used to collect rewards, but the reward is far from 5 million. The heads of the company discuss the Death March, which would cause all the mind demonite and defeated monsters to return all at once. During their journey, Kinji comes up with an idea to pay off his debt, creating a monster farm where the monsters won't be aggressive because Rim is keeping an eye on them. They would take what they need to earn rewards and let them heal. Kinji is happy to have started the first business for the company. Shia questions Kinji's methods, as he's making money very easily compared to Reizaha's ways. However, an earthquake happens, causing Shia and Kinji to fall into a new area of the dungeon where she starts defeating various monsters. While Shia, with her superhuman abilities, easily kills lower-level monsters, Kinji doesn't want to lose himself, so he supports her. A powerful monster named Majin appears and starts attacking Shia. 
She understands that she was brought here so he could use her to gain strength. If she loses her strength, Majin would torture her to death. Majin proves to be superior and knocks her down. Shia knows it's her duty to kill Majin. Kinji asks for the stone that would help them escape, but it can only be used for one person. Shia decides to use a teleportation stone on Kinji to escape, but Kinji cancels it. Instead, he uses the stone and throws it at Majin, making it appear on the surface and creating chaos. Kinji sets a trap for Majin, knowing it will return because it seeks Shia's magical power. He buys some time. After a few minutes, Majin returns, and Kinji activates the trap with the help of ants and Shia. They try to lock Majin in place with cement using many ants. With Shia's magic, they try to dry the cement super quickly. However, Majin manages to escape, so the group decides to flee and go to their second plan, using Shia as bait. As she needs to rest before being at full strength to defeat Majin, Kinji ties her to the pole on his back. To defeat Majin, they needed to pump in enough magic power to kill it in one blow. Majin falls into a new trap set by Kinji, using his farm animals. The goop he fell in was flammable, causing the monster to catch fire. It goes into a frenzy, shooting lightning in all directions. Chia decides to sacrifice herself to stop it. But Kinji stops her, insisting that she doesn't need to risk her life. Although she wanted to risk her life for the company, Kinji knew she was doing it for her father, who was a failure. This prompts Shia to talk about the importance of proper work and contributing to society, as she was taught in Reizeha. Kinji grabs her to help her regain her composure, and Shia strikes him. After this, Kinji tries to convince her that Reizeha's ideas are wrong, telling her she doesn't have to be anyone's puppet. This eventually persuades her to assist the protagonist. For the third plan, he used the company's stolen staff to bury Majin under the rubble, but it escapes that as well. Kinji asks Shia to face Majin, allowing her to use her best attack, ultimately defeating it. However, it rises once more, and Kinji reveals that he knew it would awaken again. As he was standing directly near him, the monster was about to attack, prompting Rim to be called because she did not want Kinji to die as he was her food. Rim transforms into her monster form and eliminates Majin with a single bite, ending the conflict. But suddenly, a portal appears beneath Kinji and Rim, causing them to fall, and Kinji realizes that the portal is the same one that brought him to Zenda. In a different scene, Kinji woke up in his house in Japan, feeling relieved. It seemed like no time had passed. He decided to relax and watch television. However, he noticed on the news that Rim had appeared in the city, searching for him. This caused everyone in the city to start looking for him to demand an explanation. Kinji became nervous. Then, Rim appeared behind him in her human form and asked him for food. Suddenly, Kinji woke up and realized it was all a dream. It turned out Kinji and Rim were actually sent 300 years into the future of Zenda. A girl named Ranga appeared before him and told the protagonist that the human race was on the brink of extinction, and they needed his help. Kinji was confused, so he asked Rim to hit the wall so they could escape. But he noticed an elaborate city. The people were forced to live in underground cities. Zazel, the city's leader, appeared and revealed that 300 years ago, the Reizaha Corporation abused its power and resources, weakening the human race. This caused the Demon King to awaken and threaten to dominate the world, using monsters to rule. After 300 years, their resources had started to deplete, and they didn't know how long they would last. Zazel told the protagonist that a book of prophecies in the miraculous gate was discovered on the surface. Using that book, they summoned the savior, meaning Kinji. Zazel wanted to share the message, so he introduced Kinji to a group of refugees who started to admire him as their new savior. Seeing them, Kinji became disappointed and decided to leave, thinking that humans now only knew how to depend on others. However, Zazel stopped him while aiming a gun and pleaded for him not to abandon them. Despite the threat, Kinji refused to help. Hearing this, Zazel revealed that once Kinji defeated the Demon King, he could return to Japan, astonishing Kinji. Eventually, he accepted Zazel's proposal, and after a few hours, Kinji and Rim prepared to search for the Demon King. Ranga appeared and offered to help them, treating the protagonist with affection. Kinji noticed something strange about Ranga and began to inspect his body, revealing that Ranga was, in fact, a man, which surprised him. Zazel told Kinji that the prophecy said a child with magical powers must become the priestess, and Ranga was the only child in their town. Kinji decided to accept Ranga into his team. The group left the underground city to explore the desolate surface. They traveled on a motorcycle to find the Demon King. But Kinji realized that Rim was very hungry, causing him to panic. They decided to stop at the nearest castle, as Ranga mistakenly identified it as the Demon King's castle. 
Upon arriving, Ranga destroyed the entrance with a spell, leaving Kinji surprised and nervous. A guard appeared, questioning them about the damage. They learned that the castle actually belonged to a section chief assistant. Kinji began to berate Ranga for leading them to the wrong place. Inside, Rim created a commotion searching for food, and the guard took Kinji and Ranga to see the castle's chief. There, they encountered a giant ant, and it was revealed that it was Ante, whom Kinji had saved years ago. Anta invited them to a grand banquet. Anta reveals that the monsters left the dungeon to subjugate humans, along with the ants, after Kinji left them. However, a human interrupted their conversation, complaining that the monsters have been exploiting them. Kinji realizes that humans now have regular jobs, working eight hours a day with two days off. He gets mad because it was not the slightest bit exploitative after what he saw 300 years ago. Anna explains that it was Kinji who inspired them to give humans a fair deal and taught them work ethic. However, humans have become lazy over time, and Anta is saddened by not knowing what to do with his workers, as their group handles the army's main activities. Kinji asks Anta if he can meet the Demon King, but he's told that only high-ranking individuals can see him. Kinji decides to help so that humans start working again, allowing him to rise through the ranks and meet the Demon King. He calls this Dungeon Black Company of the future. Over time, Kinji strengthens the army, motivating humans to work harder for the rewards they can receive, leading to increased income for the Demon King's army. After a few days, Kinji returns to the underground city and announces that he will work for the Demon King's army. He is now the Demon Lord Army's Deputy Assistant Section Chief. From now on, he will govern the underground city in his own way and promises that everyone will have more peace than before. After several days, the group decided to rest and celebrate in some hot springs. Kenji had been promoted to general within the Demon King's army. However, they were being spied on by three individuals named Ru, Power, and Holler, who were high-ranking members of the Demon King's army. They began to complain about Kenji's rapid rise through the ranks, fearing that their positions might be in danger. Each of them decided to come up with a plan to discredit Kinji and potentially strip him of his current position. A few days later, Kinji received a mission from Power to hunt down several deserting monsters. However, Power ambushed him using a giant worm, believing Kinji wouldn't be able to defeat it. To her surprise, Rim took down the worm with a single blow, and the worm requested to join their group, which Kinji accepted. The next day, Ru challenged Kinji to a new mission, to create a farm on an impossible-to-cultivate plot of land. Kinji decided to use the giant worm to prepare the land, and he asked Ranga to use his magic to accelerate seed growth. This strategy helped Kinji defeat Ru. Now, only Holler remained, and he planned to exploit Ranga to get to Kinji and find a weakness. The next day, Holler appeared before Ranga in the hot springs and tried to take advantage of him, asking him to remove his towel under the pretext of being his superior. Ranga obeyed, but Holler discovered that Ranga was actually a man, causing him to fall to the ground in surprise. Rim arrived to bathe with Ranga and Kinji, inadvertently sending Holler flying. After a few hours, it's revealed that Kinji was aware of being spied on, and he uses a camera to taunt the high-ranking officers, showing that he easily passed each of their tests. He tells them that he will soon take their positions, infuriating the high-ranking officers in frustration. After several days, the group is sent on a new mission where they have to fight a giant robot controlled by the three ravens. The robot uses a mysterious ray on Ranga, causing him to experience hallucinations. It's revealed that Ranga is a descendant of Belza, which is why he has been pursued since he was a child. Kinji helps Ranga come to his senses, and Rim manages to defeat the giant robot. Kinji is delighted because he will soon be promoted to a council member for completing the mission. Ranga asks Kinji if it's okay to retreat from certain things, and Kinji responds that it's not always a bad thing, as it can be a temporary withdrawal to ensure a future victory. Ranga is overjoyed and starts crying with happiness. After this mission, Kinji is summoned by the Demon King and arrives in the throne room with Ranga and Rim. It is revealed that the Demon King is actually a girl named Sky, and she asks Kinji to save the world. Sky revealed herself to be Rim's younger sister, leaving Kinji surprised. She was the ruler of the countless monsters that inhabited the barren land. As she tried to approach Kinji and the group, her head came off. She explained that since Rim removed it, it couldn't stay in place. Sky then transformed into her monster form, revealing that she was actually the Majin that Rim had defeated in the past. She clarified that Rim and she were the guardians of the dungeon, responsible for managing magic powers in this world. 
Additionally, their duty was to protect the treasures in the dungeons from humans. Rim was dismissive the whole time and said that she did not know. Sky shared the history of the planet when the civilization called Colonians was at its peak and created magic power. They controlled space and time. It was them who transferred Kinji through time and space again and again. But after Rim started spending a lot of time on the surface and forgot about her duties, the circulation of magic power within the dungeon was cut off. In response, the dungeon hastily birthed a replacement, Sky. Kinji had just one question, could he go back to Japan? Sky said he could, but there were a few key players missing before the discussion. Their conversation is interrupted by enemy ships belonging to Reizaha. They had been hiding the whole time. In the past, they arrived at a special location in the dungeon known as the Ruins, where they discovered advanced technology. Sky explained that this technology belonged to Colonians. The mass consumption of magic power using the Ruins brought the ruination of the world. As a guardian, she had to ensure circulation, so she attacked Reizaha. She was able to force them to retreat into the rift between dimensions, but it did not last long. The final war for this world was going to begin soon. If they won, the planet would contain no life, as they wanted to produce only corporate grunts. She wanted Kinji to go back in time to stop Reizaha. When Kinji asked why she chose him, she said because he is the only person she knew who does not know when to give up. After explaining all of this, Sky gave Kinji two options. One door led to Japan, and the other door took him 300 years into Zenda's past. Kinji chose to return to Zenda's past because he didn't want Reizaha to succeed in its plans. He hated their ideals. Kinji, Rim, and Ranga returned to the past, and Kinji now possessed a futuristic gun. The reunion with Shia and Wanai was filled with excitement. Belza summoned Kinji, informing him of a large debt due to his one-month absence, and that his room had been taken away. After this, Kinji decided to stay at Shia's house for a while. Later, the group attended a bar event organized by Reizaha for its employees. Kinji took advantage of the occasion to eat and drink as much as he could. However, the company wouldn't pay for Rim and Ranga, so Kinji took responsibility for them. Despite the hangover the next morning, Kinji enjoyed his time at the bar. Ranga was given a job by the company director, impressing customers with her cuteness. With Rim's uncontrollable hunger, Kinji noticed his debts were increasing. To earn more money in the dungeons, he planned to overtake Belza and reach the ruins before them. Acquiring advanced technology would allow him to establish the ultimate ideal dystopia. Kinji realized that the dungeons had become more dangerous during his absence, as the monsters had grown stronger. The group decides to return to Shia's house, where Kinji emphasizes the urgency of reaching the ruins before Reza had to harness the power of the Colonians and repay his loans. However, Shia interrupts, showing Kinji some statistics revealing that he is much weaker compared to other employees, being at level 5 while some are at level 20. His survival in the dungeons is at risk. Shia decides to train Kinji and Wanaib to improve their chances. The following day, an intense training regimen begins, pushing their bodies to the limit. After physical training, Shia prepares them for various magical power tests. Kinji, feeling overwhelmed, questions what magical power is. Shia explains that it is the conversion of airborne mana into a force that has a tangible effect in the world. This power allows individuals to achieve seemingly impossible feats. She demonstrates how to breathe in mana and circulate it within the body. However, Kinji, being from another world, realizes he cannot use magic. Kinji is confused and saddened by the revelation that he cannot use magic, realizing he might be the weakest person in Zenda. After the training, he goes to a bar with Wanaib, drowning his sorrows in alcohol and becoming deeply despondent about his lack of magical abilities. Despite his emotional distress, Kinji regains his composure, surprising Wanaib with his emotional control. Later, at Shia's house, Kinji observes Ranga and Rim making noise and asks them to quiet down. Kinji notices a futuristic gun that Ranga was playing with, deciding to take it. Even though the gun doesn't work for him, he thinks of selling it for a good price. Rim begins to bite the gun, causing it to glow, revealing its ability to absorb magic from its surroundings. The gun is designed to protect its owner in dangerous situations and brings comfort to combat needs by transforming into a humanoid after setting a password. Realizing this, Kinji decides to venture into the dungeon with the group, aiming to reach the fifth floor where Reizaha is currently located. The monsters on this floor are particularly formidable, and many workers are stuck there, with time running out. As they discuss strategies, they encounter some monsters. Kinji tests the gun and successfully defeats them with a single shot. He is elated not only to be physically strong but also to have a magical gun for protection. 
However, the gun starts absorbing all the energy around it because Kinji doesn't know how to control it, detecting an emergency and causing the mana made clothes of everyone to unravel. Shia becomes furious with Kinji and slaps him. In response, the group binds Kinji and reprimands him for his carelessness. Kinji, angered at the gun for being unreliable, finds that it is stuck to him like a persistent stalker. The gun becomes upset and is on the verge of self-destruction, with Kinji at risk of collateral damage. To save himself, he decides to give the gun another chance. Later, the group encounters a team of hunters from Reizaha in the dungeon and chooses to continue descending alongside them. Eventually, they arrive at a ruined and abandoned chamber. One of the hunters decides to share a tale with the group. The story revolves around a hero and a mage who set out to rescue a girl from a dragon. When they located the monster, the hero triumphed, but the mage betrayed the hero. Subsequently, the hero was imprisoned, unable to reunite with the girl, who happened to be his lover. Sadly, he perished due to sorrow and despair. After narrating the story, the hunter suggests that the hero's ghost might be present in this dungeon leading the group to speculate that the ghost caused the chamber's current ruined state. Suddenly, numerous zombies appear and launch an attack. Shia observes that based on their equipment, they were likely adventurers who had stayed in the area. Shia tries to halt the zombies, but they rapidly rise again. They manage to capture one of the hunters who eventually transforms into a zombie after a bite. The zombified hunter, along with the other zombies, leads them to their hideout. Shia notices that Kinji has also been abducted. Rim, relying on her keen sense of smell, traces him, unveiling a concealed entrance protected by illusion magic. The entrance guides them down a lengthy staircase to an illicit potion factory where zombies are coerced into labor. Within the factory, Ranga discerns that a spell, disseminated by a sign in the room, controls the zombies. The zombies transmit the spell through whispers, instantly influencing others. The group decides to feign being under the spell to move undetected among the zombies and approach the sign. However, one of the zombies rebukes Shia for not fulfilling her responsibilities properly, triggering her anger. Subsequently, all the zombies realize that the group was merely pretending to be affected by the spell, prompting them to attack. The group fights against the zombies while strategizing on how to reach the controlling sign. After a few minutes, Wanib holds off the horde of zombies, creating a path for Ranga to reach the sign and shatter it. This action returns the zombies to their normal state prompting the group to head back to the surface. Rim informs them that Kinji is nearby, so they set out in search of him. Along the way, Ranga inquires about Rim's relationship with Kinji, and she explains that she used to be with him for the food, but now she enjoys spending time with him. Shia observes Kinji's ability to gather followers. They eventually arrive in the room where Kinji is reprimanding the one responsible for turning the employees into zombies. It turns out to be the mage from the legend. She corrects the story, revealing that it was the hero who betrayed her. The mage killed the dragon but was abandoned by the hero afterward. In response, she used a barrier spell to imprison the hero in the dungeon. The hero forcibly broke free from the barrier and escaped, branding the mage as a traitor. Ostracized and fallen in social status, she toiled tirelessly and eventually succumbed to overwork. Due to Kinji's resemblance to the hero, the mage had kidnapped him in an attempt to brainwash him. However, Kinji successfully resisted her efforts. The mage discloses that she endured ceaseless toil until her death and had planned to return to the surface to enforce the same fate on all humans. Wanaib informs her that people on the surface are already being compelled to work tirelessly, and upon learning this, the mage loses her remorse and can finally find peace. She expresses gratitude to Kinji and bids him farewell. The group then visits a Reizaha shop within the dungeon, managed by a girl named Cindy. Kinji, initially upset about the quality of the clothes, discovers that Cindy's father used to own the shop before Reizaha acquired it. Cindy wishes to buy the shop back as it holds sentimental value. Kinji decides to help her by boosting customer traffic. He also starts selling addictive potions left by the maid's ghost that Cindy was compelled to buy, claiming they will make customers stronger. In return, he negotiates a substantial discount on the gear. After a few days, Cindy's shop gains popularity as Kinji promotes the potions on television, leading to increased income. Kinji celebrates the prospect of earning more money. However, Reza has lawyers intervene to prevent them from selling the potions, citing their illegal ingredients that create strong addiction, surpassing the limits set by corporate headquarters. Recognizing the situation, Kinji decides to make a quick escape and offers an excuse for Cindy, despite her admiration for him. Determined to tackle the shop's issue on her own, Cindy resolves to find a solution. 
Kinji shares with Shia that Cindy is the kind of person who can grow independently, just needing the right opportunity. A few hours later, Kinji and the group arrive at the fourth floor of the dungeon, discovering an open and spacious area, surprising them as they step onto this floor for the first time. It resembles a forest with a sky overhead. After a few hours, the boys find themselves fleeing from several giant monsters. Quick on his feet, Kinji shoots glue on the ground, causing the monsters to halt and making it easier for Shia to defeat them. Later, they encounter Belza's search team on the fifth floor, but they have to make a swift escape due to the presence of two powerful monsters. As the ground shakes and their path is blocked off, they manage to escape. It is then revealed that the boys are now trapped on the fourth floor, with various changes in the dungeon blocking access. Both the paths to the third and fourth floors are obstructed by rubble. Meanwhile, the team of bodyguards is stuck on the fifth floor, engaged in a fierce battle with the two strongest monsters there. While Shia expresses concern for them, Kinji must think of a way to navigate the situation. The search team extends an invitation to their base, which the boys accept. Upon arrival, they witness several monsters engaged in combat with each other, leaving them surprised. A woman appears carrying a sick girl, revealing them to be the Ant Queen in human form and Little Sky. The boys decide to take them both to the camp. The Queen explains that the dungeon's abrupt changes are due to Sky's illness, and she has become the Guardian as Rim has relinquished her responsibilities. After Kinji's disappearance, the dungeon experienced a terrible tremor. The Queen asks the protagonist for help. She found Sky when she was leading her subordinates away from the epicenter of the tremor. Sky is also known as the Second Magin. The Queen wanted Kinji to save the child, so the dungeon is restored to its original state. Meanwhile, Rim feels guilty for causing Sky's illness and leaves the base to hunt for food. Upon her return, Sky rejects Rim's offer of special meat she brought, and in her rage, the Queen tries to calm her down. The Queen does not know why she was so violent. Rim then asked Queen to hand her over so she could hold Sky, but Sky rejected her and tried to bite her. The Queen said that it was maybe because Rim defeated her once, so she is scared of her. Rim steps outside for fresh air, and Kinji questions her why she was so sad. Rim confides in him about feeling guilty for neglecting her duties and asks for his help in curing Sky. Kinji agrees to help. The next day, he gathers the group to explain their task of stabilizing the dungeon by altering it. Kinji was excited to put everything under his personal management. The group works in different areas of the zone to relocate dungeon monsters to their appropriate positions. They relocated the aquatic monsters to their habitat so they could regain their normal strength. Rim remains behind to care for Sky, who still doesn't fully accept her. Sky suddenly falls ill after throwing a tantrum, and Rim tries to help by placing an ice block on her head, but it quickly melts. Rim then travels to a frozen area on the fourth floor, collects giant ice blocks, and returns to the base to use them. When she sees that Sky still has a fever, Rim tears off several leaves and offers them to her. Sky decides to trust Rim and eats the leaves. After a few hours, Rim falls asleep but wakes to find that Sky is feeling much better. The group returns to the base after working with the dungeon monsters. They defeated a giant monster to normalize the mana circulation on the fourth floor. They realize that Sky has recovered, and the entrance to the fifth floor is now unblocked. Rim also named her Sky because she was impressed by the sky after she went to the surface. However, Sky suddenly feels unwell again, and the queen realizes that the dungeon has changed, with more monsters than usual on the fifth floor. So, the boys decide to head there to reach the ruins. In a scene change, we see Belza's guards on the fifth floor, led by a soldier named Aluz, battling with all their might against the new monsters on that floor. Aluz is about to be defeated by one of the monsters when Kinji appears with the group and decides to save all the guards. Seeing his men retreating, Aluz asks them to return, as he still must follow Belza's orders. However, Kinji punches him and makes him see reason. After this, Kinji starts preparing the guards to return to the fifth floor. He raises the morale of the troops by listening to their concerns and answering their queries. A few days later, the boys return and begin defeating the monsters. Observing Kinji's leadership, Aluz starts falling in love with him. Kinji wants to reach the ruins and has a large troop ready to follow him. After a few minutes, they reach some artifacts that were generating the monsters on the fifth floor. Kinji decided to destroy them, and his group started fighting the monsters protecting the artifacts. His strategies proved successful, and they defeated many strong monsters. The boys bought time for Rim, who managed to destroy the artifacts with a single attack, causing all the monsters to turn into stone, and everyone began to celebrate. An ant appeared and informed the protagonist that Sky had recovered, bringing joy to Kinji and Rim. 
Following this, the group prepared to head to the ruins on the sixth floor. Once there, they noticed a colonian door at the top of a staircase. Kinji decided to go first, claiming he was only going to investigate, which earned him the admiration of the others who thought he was sacrificing himself. But when Kinji touched the door, it turned out to be the ancestral weapon of the colonians, and he absorbed it, gaining control of the dungeon. Kinji thanked everyone for allowing him to obtain this power, surprising them. He had been loyal to his own desires all along. The group was unable to believe what they were watching. He then summoned several giant monsters and sent them to the city to spread fear. He aimed to rebuild the world into a paradise. Meanwhile, Belza became aware of this, but Kinji appeared riding a small dragon. He resigned and gave her a resignation letter, along with demonites to pay off his debts. Belza, furious, threatened him and promised that he would regret this, but Kinji departed, laughing. Three months later, Kinji transformed the dungeon into a theme park visited by numerous people, rapidly turning Black Company into a powerful corporation. Kinji revealed to Ranga that demonites were created from people's energy. This was why he turned the dungeon into a park, to attract more visitors and make more money. He capitalized on Belza's failures to control and maintain circulation. Meanwhile, Reza had began to lose profits, and Belza, along with high-ranking officials, sought a way to avoid bankruptcy. Kinji, unexpectedly, appeared at their meeting, announcing that Reza Ha would soon become a part of Black Company. Belza was angered, and she threatened him. However, the next day, Reza Ha's condition worsened, causing concern among the high-ranking officials. On the flip side, Black Company continued to grow rapidly. Cindy's shop also expanded significantly, and Wanibe had become a scientist, maximizing the use of demonites, thereby increasing the company's value. Frustrated and angry with Kinji, Belza drinks at a bar. After getting drunk, she decides to return home and encounters Ranga, who bluntly tells her that she'll never gain control of the dungeon's power. Ranga points out that Belza has already lost to Kinji and taunts her about being unloved, infuriating Belza. In a fit of rage, she throws her bag at him, but Ranga skillfully returns the bag by hitting it with his staff, unintentionally hitting Belza in the face. Ranga then departs, leaving Belza seething. While picking up her scattered papers from the bag, Belza finds she is record and decides to use it as leverage against Kinji since Shia continues working for Reza. Belza, using Shia's coercion, forces her to reveal all the illegal actions committed by Kinji at Reza, leading to Kinji's arrest for breaking several laws. The story takes a turn as Belza and several members of Reza are summoned to testify, presenting all the necessary evidence against Kinji. Belza manipulates Shia by asserting that the workers were worse off under Black Company. In the press, Belza testifies that Kinji is the Demon King, aligning him with the literature. Wanaib and Ranga, present at the conference, are terrified at the prospect of the threat to humanity law being applied to Kinji. Meanwhile, Kinji finds himself confined in an interrogation room, enduring torture from a special investigator named Sari who subjects him to a special suit cutting off external magic power. After enduring hours of suffering, Shia visits Kinji. Witnessing his deteriorating condition, she uses magic to heal him. Apologizing to Kinji, she believes she was doing the right thing. However, he urges her not to blame herself, assuring her that he hasn't given up, and his determination to fight remains intact. In another scene, Wanaib gathers the group at Black Company, and reveals that Kinji left them an emergency manual. They decide to use it to free him. A month later, a shareholders meeting unfolds at Reizaha, discussing positions in the company. The organizer mentions that Kinji will be the next head of Reizaha, surprising Belza. Wanaib and Ranga interrupt the meeting, revealing that Black Company acquired a share of Reizaha's value, granting them a percentage of power among the shareholders. This secures the majority of votes for Kinji to become the new leader. Kinji enters the meeting accompanied by Shia and Sari who assert Kinji's innocence. Shia provides evidence that disproves his alleged crimes. As a result, Kinji assumes the position of the company's head, and Belza is compelled to work under him. Over time, Kinji regains all the power he once had, but his demeanor becomes peculiar in the presence of Wanaib. Wanaib recalls Kinji's earlier statement about being an outsider, leading him to believe that Kinji is prepared to return to Japan after completing his mission. However, Kinji surprises everyone by revealing that he has no intention of leaving Zenda. He recognizes that his life is more enjoyable when he has a goal, and plans to travel to discover new dungeons across Zenda to gain more power. After sharing his decision, Kinji decides to continue with the celebration. The following day, he returns to the mining zone where he initially started working entering through a secret entrance to reach the third floor. There, he rediscovers the coin he lost months ago, vowing to conquer the world with it.
Watch this next video. See you on the next one.